my talk today is, is actually a tutorial on understanding PRC NMR spectroscopy. The idea is to go uh, through the basics of this experiment, um, not in too much detail because it will take too much time. And uh, I will focus on understanding each of the elements instead of just the application of the new methods that we and other, many other researchers have been developing over the last few years on PRC NMR. So let's gonna make it a start. I hope you are all seeing my screen. Um, the talk is divided in four sections. First, just an introduction, talking about why PRC is important and where is it used. Then we will focus on the key concepts uh, regarding those methods and also on the different acquisition methods and the different active spin refocusing elements. We will go in detail about what that means later on that are used in most of PureSieve experiments uh, today. So let's gonna start with a, an introduction about what is PureSieve. Pure NMR is, is a technique that allows us to obtain a pure spectrum in which peak position is only determined by chemical sieve, meaning that we don't have information about the scalar couplings and we only have information about the chemical sieves. Why we would like to do that? So if we compare the conventional spectrum with the pure spectrum, we can see that while in the conventional spectrum we have very useful information on chemical sieve, homonuclear couplings, and heteronuclear couplings. In the pure sieve one, we sacrifice part of that information. We remove the information of homonuclear and heteronuclear coupling to get only chemical sieve information. And the main reason for that is to deal with the always present problem of signal overlap. Very common in NMR spectra, we encounter situations like that here, where we have several signals with all the multiplicity, all of them overlapping, which makes the spectral resolution being poor or very poor and complicating the analysis of the spectrum. Um, so we were here just um, highlighting where we will need pure safe uh, NMR methods, and it's basically when we have problems of signal overlap because by removing all the homonuclear and heteronuclear couplings, we can reduce the spectral complexity massively, enhance the signal resolution, which simplify the spectral analysis. So before we get into the detail about how the pure methods work and, and the different elements involved in them, I would like to give you a highlight of how this methodology has been used over the last 10 years. And as you can see here, this is one of the first examples, and this was for the structural analysis of the acetromycin. So it has been quite a lot used for the analysis of pure compounds, small and medium-sized molecules, where we remove all the common nuclear coupling and aiding in the structural analysis of the compound. It has been implemented in the conventional methods, but also in several 2D methods. This is an example of the homonuclear toxi of estradiol. This is the conventional toxi, and mainly in this region here where we have a lot of signal overlap. When we apply pure sheep, and in this case, in combination with covariance, we can get a very high resolution map where most of, if not all, the signal overlap is eliminated, and we can do the full assignment and, and, and read perfectly the correlations between the signals. It has been also used in heteronuclear experiments, mostly in HSQC type of experiments, either for the proton carbon or for the proton nitrogen. It has been used quite a lot also to measure heteronuclear couplings, and this is because the conventional PRC methods remove homonuclear couplings, but not the heteronuclear ones. So when we remove, if we have an example here of a fluorinated molecules, by removing all the homonuclear couplings in the proton spectrum, we obtain a pure sieve containing only the multiplicity due to the heteronuclear coupling, facilitating uh, its extraction. Uh, however, when we have very complicated proton spectra, like this case here for a mixture of fluoroprolines, 
even with a conventional pure CIF spectro, uh, which is simplified, but it may be very, very difficult to get the heteronuclear couplings. And very recently, a uh, methodology that also removed the heteronuclear couplings, we call it fully pure CIF, um, by comparing this new methodology with the conventional pure CIF, we only were able to extract all the heteronuclear couplings. Also, it has been used to measure 1D bond couplings, proton carbon in HSQC, FLIP HSQC spectra. Also, long range uh, heteronuclear couplings from the 2D long range experiments, in this case, the HSQ MBC, being able to measure directly the, the long range proton carbon and the proton proton from the spectrum. Also, to extract RDCs, residual dipolar couplings, by removing the homonuclear couplings. It has been used quite a lot for the analysis of complex mixtures because these are the most common case where we have severe signal overlap in our spectrum, as we can see here for the p oil. In this case, it was implemented in the conventional selective toxic, uh, which uh, allows us to obtain pure chemical save information from each of the main components of the piperamine oil sample. Also implemented in the 2D in combination with the spectral analyzing and non-uniform sampling. And it has also been used for diffusional studies here in combination with diffusion experiments to remove all the homonuclear couplings, allowing the separation in this case of two structures, vitamin D and provitamin D, which are very similar with only 4% different in the diffusion coefficient. And also for enantiomeric mixers to quantify the enantiomeric purity and to measure relaxation times, uh, constant times like T1 or T2, uh, implementing it in the conventional inversion recovery or project experiments. And more recently, also in the relaxation experiment called REST using uh, this approach. So as you can see, these simplifications really helps to interpret NMR spectra, uh, but there are many different experiments that they can be considered as pure shift experiments. They, I, I would group them in four uh, categories. The first one are those that produce a pure shift or a homonuclear decoupled FID. Then there are also the family of experiments that we can get this kind of 1D spectra where only containing chemical shift information from 1D projections. For example, the 2DJ or the anti set COSI. We can also have decoupling just in one of the dimensions of the 2D and, and then apply covariance to get a fully pure shift spectrum. And we can use other mathematical reconstruction techniques to obtain just um, chemical safe information. Today, I will focus just on the methods that more generally we call pure shift methods that are those that allows us to obtain a homo uh, nuclear decoupled FID. So how do we get this perfect pure shift spectrum? I have to say that this pure shift spectrum I'm showing here is a simulated spectrum. This is not a real one. So that's why I say a perfect pure shift spectrum. So if we go back and see how the proton NMR experiment works, basically we apply a 90 degree pulse and detect and we Fourier transform and we obtain a proton spectrum containing information of chemical sieve and uh, scalar couplings. So this means that during the FID, we have both the evolution of chemical sieve, but also the evolution of these scalar couplings. If we want to remove those, we need to manipulate the magnetization during the, um, the evolution of the FID or during the experiment. So the simplest experiment to, to look back and see how this works is the conventional heteronuclear decoupling. So if we want to decouple proton from another nuclei, in this case, we have two channels. And in the very, very simple case, just as an illustration, we could say that we could apply a series of 180 degree pulses uh, in the middle of the acquisition points. 
And this would be a heteronuclear spin echo where we apply a 180 degree push in one of the channels, but not in the other one, not in the proton. And this will allow us to refocus the heteronuclear couplings while we leave the chemical sieve uh, on the proton and the proton-proton couplings to evolve. So during the FID, uh, following this approach, we will remove the effect of the heteronuclear couplings and we will keep the effect of the uh, homonuclear and chemical shift. We need to keep in mind that this is not what we do in reality, but if we want, we kind of could do that because of the timing involved here. The sampling interval is of the order of microseconds, around 50 microseconds most of the time. And the heart pulses in the X channels are really short, are also in the order of microseconds. So we could accommodate those within those acquisition sampling intervals. However, if we try to follow the same logic for decoupling proton from protons, that would not be as straightforward. First, because everything happens in the same channel. So we will have to interrupt the acquisition to apply 180 degree pulses, for example. But even if we do that, this is not what we don't want because by doing that, in this case, now we have a homonuclear spin echo. And this homonuclear spin echo will refocus the chemical sieve. So we will not have information about the chemical sieve and the homonuclear coverings will evolve. So this is exactly the opposite that we want. So this is strategy, we could not apply it even if it would be possible in to, to obtain decoupled, homodecoupled proton spectra. What we would need is an element that it could be applied there that allows us to refocus the homonuclear coupling while leaving the chemical sieves to evolve, but it should last just a few seconds. So this is not technically currently a viable. So how far we are from this idea of pure sieve? Because we get pure sieve spectra. So these are three spectrum, just the spectra, the conventional, the ideal, the synthetic one, and the real and experimental pure sieve. So we are not in the ideal situation where all the signals are at the same intensity and, and beautiful line shapes, but we are very, very close. And then how do we get this uh, pure sieve spectrum then? So I try to group the two key ideas behind those, uh, all those pure sieve spectrum in two elements. The first element is the homo decoupling element. And the other one is how do we get a homo decoupled FID? This homodecoupled element is an element that it will allow us to perform this um, play that we want to be wanted to refocus the J while leaving the chemical sieve. And there are different elements that can be used for that. We'll go into details of those. I will not get into it now. Regarding of how we homodecouple the FID, there are two approaches and these are two acquisition methods, either the interferogram and the real time. So we will go into the detail of all these elements, but in general, two main concepts. We need to have an element that allows us to manipulate independently J's and chemical C, but we also need to control what's going on during the FID to decouple it. So let's go start with the first of the elements, the homo decoupling element. As we said before, we need an element that we focus J and leave the chemical sieve to evolve. And this element already exists. It was published by Garbon and co workers in 1982, so quite a long time ago. And this is what we call the J refocusing element. So this element consists um, of two um, spin echoes. And the key part of it is this active spin refocusing element which allows us to divide the viable spins into two sets, the actives, and which are the ones we are gonna observe, and the passive ones, that are the ones that we are gonna manipulate, but we will not observe in the final spectrum. So let's gonna see a bit in detail this idea of active and passive spins. When we acquire conventional exper experiments, sorry, um, we have, hundred thousands of uh, molecules in our NMR tube. And basically for each of the signals, every proton in every molecule is contributed to it. 
So basically, all spins are active. All spins in our um, active volume uh, is, uh, is producing a signal in the final spectrum. The case, for example, when we are using a band selective uh, pulse, for example, here a 90 degree pulse, now this selective pulse divides the spins into actives and passives, and the passive ones are only the ones we are observing. So basically, in this case, we are selecting one proton, let's say protons uh, marked in blue. So all the protons, all the spins, the blue spins in all the molecules in the, in the tube will contribute to that signal. In the case of the pure sieve, we have band selective pure sieve experiments. So the idea is the same. If you look back, the only difference between these two is that we have removed the homonuclear coupling. So we have a single peak now, but the idea is the same. We are selecting one signal and all the signals in all the molecules are contributing to it. So all these blue spins are active spins while all the others in the molecule are the passive. But when we want to get a broadband or what we want to see the whole NMR spectrum, the strategy is a bit different. And what we are really doing is to uh, make the trick of only observing a specific signals from a specific molecules. And each of these uh, signals from each specific molecule is contributing to the spectrum. So now different spins from different molecules are gonna be the active ones, are gonna be the ones contributing to the final purity spectrum. So main idea, active spins, the ones that we observe, passives, the ones that we do not observe. And this idea is really important in the purity experiments because we can differentiate between actives and passive spins um, using different uh, building blocks or different elements. Currently, there are four general elements available, the band selective, the sanger sterk the Bird, and the Psyche. And the main difference between them is how they select these active and, and passive uh, spins. We will go into the details of those later. So if we look at the whole element, the JLP focusing element and the mechanism of it, basically what we have is a art spin echo and a selective spin echo side by side. How those, well, what is going on during these spin echoes? So if we look at the first one and here I just plot in one single spin um, with a, a J coupling, we can see that during the echo, the spins evolve with the chemical sieve and also the J and after the echo, the spins go back to the original position. So chemical sieve is refocused, but the J is not refocused. So we normally try to represent this in simple terms. And we use this plus and minus uh, nomenclature, which basically um, indicates the sense of the evolution of the, the chemical sieves and the J. So in this case, for the uh, chemical sieve, it evolves in one direction during the first part of the echo, and then evolves in the opposite direction to be refocused during the second. So at the end of it, it we say is refocused. If these two timings are the same, the chemical sieve will be refocused. As we saw here, in the case of the heteronuclear coupling, it is not refocused, so it's evolving during the whole time. During the selective echo, the situation is slightly different because now we have chemical sieve evolving and J, but at the end of the echo, both chemical sieve and J are recoupling, are refocused at the end of the echo. So we have both of them refocused. So when we put these two together, um, we need to keep in mind that the first element affects to all spins. But the second one, as we are using this active spin refocusing element, this is only gonna be the case for the active spin. So only the active spins will have the chemical sieve refocus and the J during this selective echo. And the key idea of this year refocusing element is that if we place it in the middle of an evolution time, in this case, um, Delta, if we put it at the middle of it, and we look what happened before and after this J refocusing element block, we can see that the chemical sieve is positive, positive, negative, negative, positive, and end up positive. So before and after the element, chemical sieve evolves, while the 
homonuclear coupling change the sense of the evolution, so it will be refocused. And keep in mind that it will be only for active spins. So this is the key element that allows us to manipulate independently the evolution of the chemical seed and the evolution of the scalar couplings. So this is exactly what we want. A great uh, advantage of this element is that allows us to manipulate or to control where the J is going to be refocused. And this is a very important point on all purity experiments. So for example, if we look at here, if we have this time in here, and we keep going with the plus and minus symbols, the J is only going to be refocused after two times tau one. We have time here where the J is evolving, here is refocused. So if we want to refocus the J, we will have to have an extra timing at the end to compensate for that evolution. While if we don't have any timing around this echo, the J will be refocused straight after the evolution period. So this idea of being able to control where do we want to refocus the J is really important as we will see later on. And it's important mainly for how we acquire the data. And let's gonna take a look at about how these pure shift methods manipulate or acquire the data. All of them based on the idea of a data, chunking data acquisition. If we go back to what we mentioned before and say we need to apply a homo decoupling element right after each acquisition point, we have the element now, is this J refocusing element. We have different active spin refocusing elements, great. But if we look at the timings, this is the reason why this is not currently possible. The duration of all these active spin refocusing elements is in the order of milliseconds, while the dual times is in the order of microseconds. So there is no way we can place this element between uh, this sampling interval. So what we do is separate tricks to, to get that done. The first one was done by Carbon in 18, 1982, and his strategy was like, okay, if it's not possible to place the element between the acquisition points, let's go and acquire one single point at a time. So it's acquiring a series of experiments where it's placing the J refocusing element in the middle of an evolution time. So analogous to a 2D experiment, and he was recording just the first point of each FID. By doing that, the first point, he, it's, we ensure that J is refocused while we leave the chemical sieve to evolve. So in the second point, J will be refocused, but chemical sieve will keep evolving and so on. So the first point of each FID will have the J refocused, refocused but the chemical sieve evolving. So what we can do is to take all of these, all of these individual uh, points and reconstruct an FID, a pure FID that we can Fourier transform and get a pure shift spectrum. This is the very first pure shift spectrum from 1982, uh, which is was is really impressive. However, it has a disadvantage, and is that if we want to get a FID with enough resolution, we need to acquire a lot of points, like 8,000 points. And this means a lot of time. So to acquire this very simple pure sieve spectrum, it takes hours, like between 24 and, and between one or two days to acquire it, making the experiment extremely long and impractical. And that was the main reason probably why pure sieve wasn't used for very long time until uh, until 1997, where Sanger um, came with this idea of saying, okay, can we exploit the, the slow evolution of the J to make a trade and say, if we plot here the evolution of different J couplings of different magnitudes, 5, 10, and 15 hertz, we can see that they evolve with time, fine. But Sanger trick was like, well, if we look at the beginning of the evolution, at the very, very beginning, like the first 10 milliseconds or so, the evolution can be, it's really, really small. Can we consider it negligible? 
So it would be possible instead of acquire a single point to acquire a chunk of data where J is refocused at the beginning, assuming that this chunk of data is really short compared with the time that the J needs to evolve, we can assume that the evolution of the J is going to be negligible and we could get a pure a spectrum. And actually, it was possible and this saves a lot of time and it was possible to acquire the experiments now in minutes. And this is when people start to realize, okay, this pure experiment may be useful and practical. It was a second step to speed up the acquisition. Uh, and the idea was to see, well, if J is refocused at here at the beginning, we have this variation, but if we control where we refocus the J and instead of um, refocus it at the beginning of each of the chunks and then concatenating the chunks, we refocus it, sorry, in the middle of the chunk, we will have the same evolution either side, so the same um, amount of evolution, but it will allow us to acquire chunks double size, so twice longer, which will allow us to reduce the experiment time in half. And this is how we are running most, if not all, pure sieve experiments right now and allows us to acquire a pure sieve experiment in a single minute. So we have looked at these two key elements, the JRP focusing element to manipulate evolution of J and chemical C, and also how to acquire the data. But most of people refers to the pure sieve experiment depending on the active spin refocusing element used or the acquisition method used. So let's gonna look a bit more in detail about the difference between those. Let's gonna start with the acquisition methods. There are two big group of methods. There is a new one now in the middle, but I will not have time to look about, uh, about it. But these two general methods are the interferogram approach and the real-time approach. And the main difference between them is if we acquire this chunk of data as a 2D data set or in a single experiment. In the case of the interferogram approach, is the same used by carbon, but instead point by point, we use chunk by chunk. So we acquire a series of increments uh, in a 2D style where we place the J refocusing element in the middle of the evolution time. And by incrementing this time exactly the duration of the chunk, we can be sure that in the second increment, we will start acquiring at the same, at the exact point where the first chunk finished and so on. But also we ensure that during that timing, we have only chemical sieve evolution because chemical sieve evolves during the T1 while the J is refocused during this T1 evolution. This is exactly what we want. And also we can control where the J is gonna be refocused if at the beginning or at the middle of the tank, as I previously mentioned, by adjusting these tau ones here very, very carefully regarding uh, to be half of the timing of the chunk. So we can manipulate all those things. When we have the experiments and the pool sequences, all those are encoded inside. But sometimes uh, not having things well set up and having this timing slightly off produce terrible results. So whenever you get a terrible result from a pure sieve, look back at the timing and those timings just to ensure that everything is working as uh, it should be. So the next step, once we have uh, seen that we can get this chance with the J evolving and, and uh, sorry, the J refocused and the chemical sieve evolving, we need to do a special processing to take all these chunks uh, and get them out from their individual FIDs and put them together to create a new FID, a homodecoupled FID. And this homodecoupled FID, there is a macro to do that. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, we can fully transform and get the pure sieve spectrum. But the pure sieve spectrum has some characteristic. The first one is our pure sieve signal, the signal that we want, but we also observe what we call chunking artifacts. So are these little signals here in the base of, uh, uh, of uh, the main pure sieve uh, signal? 
And those jumping artifacts are coming because in reality, we are not fully refocusing the J. We have a slight modulation and we assume that as a something very, very small and something we can work with, but is still modulated. And this modulation that we observe in the FID is a, a continuous modulation in the time domain. So when we fully transform, it create or it drives these um, frequencies that correspond with the durations of the chunk. There are methods to, I'm not gonna go into those, but there are methods to suppress or minimize those artifacts, but it's important that people who work with PureSiv have in mind that those artifacts exist and it can interfere with other signals, mainly we have um, low level signals at the same level of these uh, chunking artifacts. So this experiment is great, the quality is great, but the problem is that we need to acquire a set of uh, 1D experiments in a 2D fashion. So how we can speed things up is what the real-time approach does. So the real-time approach generates the same pure seed uh, FID, but in this case, in a single sort, in a single experiment. And how do we do that? We do that by stopping the acquisition, literally, and placing the J-refocusing element there, then start acquiring again J-refocusing element and so on. Then when we acquire this FID, all these chunks are automatically put together. We just need to do a Fourier transform and we will have our PureSIF spectrum again, this time with the PureSIF signal and the chunking artifacts on the base um, separated by the duration of these uh, chunks. So pretty similar to the previous one, uh, just in a single shot in, in one single second or two seconds, depending on what we need. Here, again, we need to be very careful with the timings and where we refocus the J. So if we don't have any timing around the heart spin echo, J is refocused at the midpoint of every chunk. However, most of the times we want to use gradients to clean things up and we have some timing surrounding this heart spin echo. So in that case, the J will not be refocused in every chunk band at the mid midpoint of every other chunk. And we need to have that in mind if we are running those experiments for fully refocus the J. If not, it will end up with much more signal uh, chunking artifacts than it should be. So, I think to keep in mind on these real-time uh, PureSIF spectra, which are really fast, is the digital resolution. The more chunks we acquire, so here is 8, 16, 32, and 64 chunks, the longer the FID is going to be, higher number of points will define our FID, so it will improve the digital resolution. Uh, so as we can see here, so signal gets narrower and narrower. However, when we acquire too many chunks in the real time, we run into the problems of irreproducibility occurring from chunk to chunks. And we need to keep that in mind and a good balance between those. Another important point of the real time spectra is not the digital resolution, but the signal resolution in, in itself, because we have to keep in mind that we are stopping the acquisition to place this J refocusing element. So it means that from chunk to chunk, signal is relaxing and we lose signal by relaxation. So the longer is this J refocusing element, the more signal we lose by relaxation. And the consequence of that is that we see bigger and bigger steps in, uh, in our FID. So here, if we are using just five milliseconds, for example, elements here, we can see these little steps here. But as we are using like 50 millisecond pulses, we can see very big steps here. Consequences, artifacts are gonna be worse, chunking artifacts, but also the, the, the FID decays faster. So the consequence is, is a broadening on our signal um, that is not C2, is purely related with signal relaxing 
during these uh, tank acquisitions. There are methods that compensate for that, like the semi-real-time approach. And um, so if you are interested, if you are having those problems, it's good to look back at those methods. So as a summary, if we compare these two ways of acquiring POC spectra, the interferogram and the real time, each of them has pros and cons. Um, the interferogram, it takes longer. The signal to noise ratio per unit time is lower. Uh, it requires some special data processing, but it's not that much of a problem because the macro for processing this data is provided. It's really available, so it should be okay. Um, tanking artifacts are present, but the FID is a smooth and normally the quality of the spectra is much better. The real, on the contrary, the real time one is much faster. The signal to noise ratio per unit time is great. We don't need any special processing. Chunking artifacts are still dead, but the FID discontinuity makes the quality of the spectra vary quite a lot depending on the elements we are using. So depending the problem you are looking at or the uh, system you have in hand, you may prefer to use one or the other. And the last important part of this purative method is the active spin refocusing element itself. We said that the J refocusing element uh, is key and um, to differentiate between active and passive. And the element that really differentiates between them is this active spin refocusing element. There are four methods available right now. The band selective, which is a rotation of 100, uh, 180 degrees on, on a selective chemical shift or a range of chemical sieve, the Sanger stack that select the slice and the sift of the frequency. So for achieving a 180 degree rotation, we can also use the BERT that relies on protons uh, coupled to carbon 13 or nitrogen 15. And we have the psyche that use these low flip angle pulses. So let's gonna look into the detail of each of them. And keep in mind that you will need to use one of those instead of the others, depending on the problem you want to analyze. So let's gonna start with the simplest one, which is the band selective. The band selective use a selective 180 refocusing pulse to refocus only the active spins of the ones that are in the band of the selective pulse. And we can select a single frequency, a single signal, or several of them if it's a band selection. And only those signals, because are the active ones, are gonna be the ones appearing in the final PRCF spectrum. So if we look at the example here of this, uh, the cyclosporine, for example, if we apply the PRCF methodology, we could apply, for example, in the region of the alpha protons. So all these protons here, and we get only PRCF those signals that we have selected with the band selective pulse. We can also get the pure sieve of the uh, amide uh, NH protons. But as you can see, only the active spins, only the ones that we are selecting with the selective pulse, pulse are showing up in the final spectrum. It's very important to keep in mind here that this only works if the protons that are selected by this selective pulse are not mutually coupled. So in the case of the amide protons, they are not coupled to each other, fine. In the case of the alpha protons, uh, they are not coupled to each other, so we can perfectly decouple them. But if we look into detail in this region, we can see that all the alpha protons are nicely decoupled, pure shape. While we have these two signals here that they remain, some of the multiplicity remains in, so it's a tablet. And this is because in this region, um, we, there are also these two protons from the arcane uh, site. These two protons are coupled to each other and we are selecting both with the band selective pulse. So we can remove the homonuclear couplings with all the other protons, but we cannot remove the homonuclear coupling between both of them because they are both being excited by these pulse. 
And this is very important. I've seen so many people to try to use this method um, with, without really considering that. And it's key for the band selective to work. We cannot excite mutually coupled protons. That's why um, this method is very well suited for molecules that have very well separated regions like peptides, proteins, or if we want to look, for example, at the anomeric part of uh, sugars, or if we want to look at isomeric mixtures. But it's not a general method and it will not give us signals from all uh, the chemical sieve region fully decoupled. Uh, this methodology is compatible with both the real time and the interferogram acquisition and the the great advantage of the band selective methods is its sensitivity because it's fully sensitive. Uh, we have a sensitivity of 100% of higher because we collapse the multiplicity of the signal in a single one. So here is a comparison of the band selective with the conventional proton all acquired in the same experiment time using real time and interferogram. As we can see in the real time, we don't pay any price in sensitivity. We even increase the sensitivity because we collapse the multiplicity. In the case of the interferogram, if we talk about signal to noise per unit time of the experiment, as we need to acquire a pseudo 2 d experiment, the overall signal sensitivity will decrease to a half, but it still is very, very sensitive. And we can see these small artifacts here, the Tankins artifacts I was talking about before. The second element is the Sangerstark element, and these elements combine the selective 180 degree pulse with the presence of a weak pulse fields gradient. By doing that, we are selecting the slice and, and the chemical shift, and this uh, element will only refocused uh, the active spin of a narrow region or a, of a slice of our sample. And again, if the selective pulse is exciting uh, spins that are mutually coupled, those will not be decoupled. So it applies the same logic as in the band selective. So to see a bit better how this slice and sieve selection works, here is a very schematic representation of what we are doing when we do a conventional experiment. We obtain all frequencies are excited, for, are excited in the whole active volume. When we have a band selective, only one frequency or a band of frequency are selected from the whole active volume. So this is the conventional selective pulses. But when we have a gradient under the selective pulse, the situation changes. Because when we only have a selective pulse, we are selecting a frequency. And we know that the frequency is proportional to the magnetic field. In a normal situation, magnetic field along the set axis is P0 and is constant. So it means that all the signals with that frequency will have the same frequency, no matter in which part of the NMR tube they are. However, when we apply this uh, gradient under the selective pulse, the situation changes because what we are doing is perturbating the magnetic fields. We are changing linearly the magnetic field. So the magnetic field along set is not constant along the set dimension anymore. It depends on where we are along the set axis. So now the same signal, let's say we have just water, the frequency, the alarm frequency of that signal will be varying depending on the position where this signal is in the NMR tube. And if we apply a selective pulse on a specific frequency, we will be only selective the signals is an, in a specific part of the NMR tube, what we call in one slice of the NMR tube. So this is the key idea behind the sanger stark experiments, being able to do this in a slice and shift selection. So when we are doing that now, what we are really doing, we are able to get a full pure spectrum, what we call the broadband pure spectrum, but each of the signal in the spectrum is coming from a different part in the NMR tube, not from the whole NMR tube. And 
The main consequence of that is that signals are only from a tiny slice in the tube and this impact in the sensitivity. So it is great because it allows us to tame a broadband spectrum. This is the first uh, sanger stark pure the spectrum that was recorded. It's compatible with the real time and the sanger stark uh, and sorry, and the interferogram acquisition, but it has the drawback of the sensitivity. The price we pay for this incredible increase in signal resolution is sensitivity. And as mentioned before, this is purely related of how the signal is obtained. We are only selecting the active spin from a specific slice of the NMR tube, and the thickness of this slice depends on the bandwidth of the selective pulse and the gradient that we are applying. The gradient that we are applying, it will depend on how, how much frequencies we want to observe and the length of the coil and the alarm of frequency and the selectivity of the pulse, the bandwidth of the pulse, it will depend very much on the system we are looking at. So it's very difficult to give a general number for those experiments because it will change from sample to sample and from situation to situation. But in general, the more selectivity we need, the lower will be the signal to noise ratio the wider the range of chemical seed we want to observe, the lower will be the sensitivity. But it also allows us to play with it. If we are only interested in one ppm on the spectrum, we can increase uh, decrease the strength of the gradient, and this will massively increase the signal to noise ratio. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a balance between uh, what we want and the sensitivity, the pure shape and the sensitivity. In general, if we compare as before, the sensitivity drawback is really, um, is, uh, the sensitivity is really low. It's about one or two percent when we are using real time and even much lower when we use the interferogram one. The third element is the BERT, is the bilinear uh, rotation decoupling element. And in this case, uh, active and passive protons are differentiated depending if they are attached or not to carbon-13 or uh, nitrogen-15. The actives are the ones that are coupled to the carbon-13 one, um, and the passive are all the others. And the key is that the vertex element inverts only the protons that are decoupled to carbon-13. So if we look schematically at how the BERT works. And just keep in mind that this is not the representation for the purative experiments, because in the purative experiment, we will not start with our magnetization uh, in set. We will be already on the transverse plane. But for simplicity, if we look at what's going on here, if we apply this BERT element, we can see that by the end of the element, the protons that are coupled or bonded to carbon-13 are inverted, this will be the active spins, while all the other protons that are not bonded to carbon-13 are going to be unaffected. So this will allow us to invert only protons that are coupled or bonded to carbon-13. And we rely on the isotopic dilution to ensure that. So this will not work if we are working with a fully labeled and rich molecules. This relies on the isotopic dilution um, to ensure that only those protons are inverted and not all the, co the coupled partners. So it's basically we are selecting different signals from different molecules in our sample. Uh, and the only thing we need to keep in mind is that in the case of the CH2 signals, both of these protons are coupled to the same carbon-13. So with the conventional simple purgative uh, BERT method, they will not be decoupled and they will, all the signals will appear decoupled, all the CH and CH3 signals, but all the CH2 signals will appear as tablets because um, they are both coupled to the same carbon-13. 
Again, there are methods to avoid that. We can use the perfect pair to, to avoid that, but I'm not going into detail. If you are working with these kind of samples, it would be good to look uh, at those methodologies. Is compatible with both the real time and the interferogram acquisition. And in terms of sensitivity, it's limited purely by the natural abundance of the carbon 13 or the nitrogen 15. So it's about 1.1%. However, this is one of the most used uh, elements in combination with the HSQC experiment because the HSQC experiments already filter the signals the proton signals only couple to carbon-13. So we are already paying that price of the sensitivity in the first place. And by using the BERT for the decoupling, we don't pay any extra. So actually the purative experiments, ATSQC purative experiment using BERT for decoupling, um, actually the sensitivity is increased compared with the conventional purative experiment, HSQC purative experiment. And those are uh, very commonly used to gain resolution and also sensitivity. The last uh, method I'm gonna talk about today is the Psyche one. This is up to date the most general method, but it's also the most complicated one to understand. Um, the Psyche methods um, use the simultaneous application of low flip angles, uh, denote by beta, some cyborgs, and the gradient. Uh, in this case, uh, the refocusing of the J couplings is achieved by the simplification of the coupling par partners using these low flip angles, similar to what we do in the anti Sarkozy experiment. And only a fraction related with the sign of two beta over spins will be the active spins and will be the ones refocused. So if we look into how this works a bit more in detail, we can go back to these um, uh, MATLAB uh, calculations done by Muhammad um, Ali for Sunday just to understand what the low flip angle pulse really does to simplify the multiplicity. So if we apply a 90 degree pulse, all the multiplicity of the signal uh, appears here with, we differentiate two peaks, the diagonal peaks and the off-diagonal peaks. Because what we are doing when we decrease the beta angle is to change the relation between the diagonal and the off-diagonal peaks, suppressing much more the signals from the off-diagonal peaks than the diagonal peaks. And those signals are the ones that are gonna re um, give rise to the pure signal. So by doing that, we can see that signal decrease, as you can see by the factor, but if we decrease it to the point that all the off-diagonal peaks are almost at the noise level. We only have the diagonals. We can extract the one, uh, the pulsive signal from the projection of that. And if we plot the variation of this pulsive signal, what we call the diagonal signal, and the off-diagonal signals that will rise, what we call these pre-coupling artifacts, we can see that we can separate the, the intensity of those vary quite a lot uh, when we change the flip angle. And if we ensure we are working in a range of flip angles between 15 and 25 degrees, we ensure that we mainly get uh, most of our signal is the pure signal and the, the unwanted signals are at a very, very low level. So that's why we normally recommend to use those experiments uh, with a flip angle between uh, around 20 degrees, because the lower is the flip angle, the cleaner is the spectrum, but the lower is the sensitivity. So again, it's a trade-off between sensitivity and spectral purity here. Um, the other thing that uh, we need to keep in mind about those experiments is that they use chair pulses. So they achieve the same idea of the anti-set cosy, but instead of using hard pulses, we are using adiabatic pulses. So what we are doing with these pulses is to uh, sweep the frequencies a whole, uh, across the whole spectral window in the in a linear way. So we start, so in case here, this is an animation for a 180 degree pulse. 
uh, it start inverting first the low frequencies and then the next one, the next one, and it's like sweeping through the spectrum until all frequencies are inverted. So experience a 180 degree pulse. In the case of the psyche, that's, that's not what's going on because we are not applying a 180 degree pulse. We are applying a low flip angle pulse. So here is a simulation for a 20 degree angle. So we never really get an inversion. We get all the spins um, uh, spinning around uh, the set axis uh, around the angle we define in the in the in the chart pose. But just to give you an idea about what this uh, salt um, adiabatic pulses really do. The other good thing about the psyche is that the use of this gradient under the um, adiabatic salt air pulses uh, allows us to remove all the unwanted signal by spatial uh, temporal averaging. So basically everything that is not experience, uh, experiencing a perfect beta uh, degree pulse is not going to be fully refocused, so it will acquire a different phase in different parts of the NMR tube. And they are, when we acquire the signal, that will be average, and only the signals of interest will remain, while all the other signals, recoupling artifacts, serum quantum signal, cosy types of response, and, and some strong uh, coupling uh, signal will be removed, which produce a very clean spectrum. Another thing to keep in mind with the Psyche is that it's only compatible with interferogram acquisition. Due to its statistical excitation, we cannot use it with the real time. We cannot ensure that the spins that are spins, the beta angle, are always the same from chunk to chunk uh, while we are acquiring the real time. So Psyche can only be used with the interferogram uh, approach. And the sensitivity of this method is the highest from all the broadband, uh, because it depends on, also it depends on the beta angle, but it's the most general method used so far. It's fully compatible with automation. It doesn't have, it doesn't need too much tuning depending on the system. And it's the most general method we have available so far to get this broadband purity uh, spectrum. So how can we combine those elements? This is just a summary. All of them are compatible with interferogram acquisition. All of them, except the psyche, are compatible with the real time. And an important point is sensitivity. If we look at the sensitivity, again, in the interferogram approach, we pay a price in sensitivity per experiment time because we have to acquire our pseudo 2D data. The real time, we don't pay any price. And regarding the active spin refocusing element, um, the band selective is the only one that is fully sensitive. All the other ones we pay uh, to a more, more or less stand a price in sensitivity. So this is important to keep in mind, depending on the samples you are analyzing. Finally, I would just like to give you here a series of review articles and book chapters um, discussing uh, about PureShift in much more detail than I did today, in case you need to go and, and look back, back for much more detailed information. And I would only like to finish to tell you that most of these PureShift methods are freely available. So in the Manchester Methodology NMR group, we put together a series of slides with all the theory, but also a data set with experimental data for you to try uh, for both uh, Brooker and, and Varian instrument with the data and all the pools program and macros available. So is all the information there. Is also available in the Brooker library. So if you are normally using the Brooker library, you can find also uh, all our experiments lots of pure experiments uh, in there to be set up in automation and, and in an easy way. And of course, if you have any questions or any problems, just let us know. And that's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. I really enjoy your talk. It's very approachable. Uh, let's keep the Q&A short and brief.
Um, um, and uh, if there are more questions, you're welcome to type in and uh, we'll try to accommodate as much as we can. So the first question is asked by Hao Li. I wonder if anyone has some experience to run pure shift experiments on benchtop spectrometer. I'm really interested in to learn if it's possible to achieve better uh, signal to noise ratio. Thanks. Are you asking me or, or in general to the audience? Uh, that uh, that was a question raised by audiences uh, named the Hao Li. And yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the audience is asking uh, if anyone has some experience uh, to run pure shift on benchtop spectrometer. Yeah, uh, for some reason my camera crashed. But uh, I, I. But we can I, hear you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can answer that. So I have no experience of running those in benchtop, but they have been done, and there are several publications on that, and it's it's really a, a game changer there. Um, I think it will be very useful. But um, not all bench benchtop system allows the implementation of the pure shift methods because you rely heavily in most of these methods on gradients. So modern benchtop spectrometers, uh, if they have a gradient unit, uh, pure shift can be implemented there and it are being implemented there. Uh, but if you don't have a gradient units, that can be trickier because you rely only on phase cycling to get clean spectra. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the next question is raised by Paninga. Mulia, sorry if I mispronounced. Uh, the first question is, uh, what is responsible for those chunks artifacts? Is it a uh, uh, CSA, chemical shape anisotropy? I think that was related to page 46, 47 ish. So, so look, it's not, it's not related with the CSA. Um, it's basically any modulation that you observe in the time domain, it transform in a frequency in the frequency domain. So what, what is going on in the pure seed is that our, our FID is being modu slightly modulated by the, by the J. So we have these bumps on the FID. We don't have a smooth FID. And these bumps are periodically repeated. And everything that periodically repeats in the FID for a transform produces a signal. So those chunking artifacts are purely coming by the fact that the FID is not completely smooth from chunk to chunk. Cool, cool. They, they can be uh, removed. So there is a method called Sapphire that actually deals with that interleaving sets of data and removing the chunking artifacts from the spectrum. Yep, yep. And the next question also by uh, Paninga. Uh, are JP inadequate and CP inadequate naturally experiments, um, like naturally pure shift experiments? Mm. I'm not really sure. I don't think so. So pure shift has been implemented in inadequate experiments. Um, um, and is on top of the inadequate one. Inadequates are, are not pure shift experiments on its own. Cool, yeah. Um, and let's move on to, we actually got a lot of questions. It really shows that uh, people are excited about your talks. Uh, so the next question is by Sandeep Kumar Panda. Uh, how decoupling impact in integration or proton count? That's a great question. Uh, that's a very common and, and a very good question. Um, so it does impact uh, on the integration. Uh, but I have to say that in our hands, um, integration is a very tricky area because uh, we need to define very well within we range of confidence we want that integration to be because almost any NMR experiment, except the, just the pulse acquired one, if we want a perfect quantification on integration, and uh, we will not get it. As soon as we apply pulses, we rely on delays for transfer and we have timing where relaxation can occur. 
uh, integration will always be slightly modified, and it also happened in the POC ones. Um, we know um, we have signal loss by relaxation and other means during the POC experiments, but this can be corrected. And actually, there are currently several groups working on making those POC quantitative. But the traditional one, no, you cannot trust the integration. You cannot trust the integration, depends what you accept, but within 10% of error, I would say. Cool. And the uh, next question uh, raised by Lamosa, uh, is it possible to use this methodology to obtain fluorine-19 spectra with uh, proton decoupling in probes with just one channel for both proton and uh, fluorine? Sure. Yes, there is no problem. We have QM3 uh, probes and we have probes where we have to switch between fluorines and, and proton. And you just need to tune a bit more the pool sequence, but yes, it can be done. Cool. Um, the question raised by Lorenzo seems to have been already touched upon. So thank you very much. We'll skip it for now for the sake of time. So the final question uh, was by Alexandro Gupta. Um, thank you for the nice talk. How do the CH2 signals look like in the bird HSQC experiment? I remember trying the sequence and the multiplicity was quite odd and doesn't look like a normal CH2 coupled signal. So if everything works well um, and you are used to using the conventional bird HSQC experiment, the CH2 should appear as doublets, because the only other proton that is coupled to the detective one is the partner one, is this the other sphere two proton. So if everything goes well, you should be able to remove the multiplicity coming from all the other protons except for the the one within the same sphere two group. So ideally, they should be doublets, but I also seen weird things happening and this is normally because something is not quite right on the experimental acquisition normally irreproducibility if you are using the real time and things like that it should be a doublet alexandro and um, that's all i can say <laughs>